Hey guys, and welcome to Money Talks News, the podcast. This episode, we're answering some common money questions. You know, I've been offering money advice for 41 years professionally. 10 as a financial advisor, 31 as a personal finance reporter. Guess what? I'm learning new things every day myself. I hope you are too, and that's why we periodically answer your questions, the one you send in by emailing us at hello at moneytalksnews.com. Today, we've got some great questions on topics ranging from retirement and annuities, I-bonds, real estate, and even the best time to buy a TV. I'm Stacey Johnson. As usual, my co-host will be financial journalist Miranda Marquette. Hello, Miranda. Hey, Stacey. I am super excited because uh, we get a lot of questions coming in to Money Talks News, so it's nice to be able to take a break and just sort of shoot the shit and, and answer people's questions and and sometimes yes, sometimes disagree a little bit. It's fun. You think we're going to disagree? Probably well, I'll tell you what today. I'm excited about, Miranda. <laughs> I'm excited about sharing the stage with you, as I am every week. And not just you. Also, our producer and novice investor, Aaron Freeman. Hello, Aaron. Hey, guys. I'm just happy that people actually write to us and listen to the show. How do you know we're not just making these questions up? <laughs> oh, is that how it works? <laughs> no, they actually are right. These are actual real questions. As you'll, you'll be able to tell probably when we start going through them. Before we do start, though, remember, guys, this is not financial advice. We can't give you personal advice because we don't know you. So make sure you do your own research before you act on anything that we say here. Be responsible for your own money, okay? Okay, let's get started. Give me a question, Miranda. All right, so our first question is from Arben. And Arben says, do you recommend the fixed indexed annuities as an option along with other forms of investing like a SEP, IRA, 401k, or traditional IRA. So do we want to add fixed indexed annuities in our asset mix? Best we define what an annuity is and then what a, what a uh, fixed index annuity is. Um, do you want to take a stab at that, Miranda or Aaron, or I will? So, well, an annuity is basically an insurance contract and you pay money and they guarantee you a payout, uh, an indexed annuity. And this is just very, very stripped down stuff. But an indexed annuity is one where the insurance contract actually gives you a bit of a bonus in terms of payout or performance based on an underlying index such as the S&P 500. So if the S&P 500 goes, does well, you could see a bigger payout. Depending on how the contract is structured, uh, if it does poorly, there might be a bottom, there might be a floor. So you might see a specific payout or specific um, performance regardless. And of course, you're going to have annuities that you pay into over time. And then at some later date, you start receiving them or you have annuities that you can say, okay, I want to do a big lump sum. I want to take a portion of my retirement account, do a big lump sum, buy the annuity at once and start getting my payouts immediately. So there's a lot of different flavors of annuity and a lot of, and some of these contracts can be very complex. So, uh, so your thoughts, yes, your thoughts, Stacey. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the the caveat to these things is that once you put that money in, uh, you cannot get it back out. Like it's not your money anymore and you can well, only live off the, the dividends it off depends. this thing. Yes. Let's be clear about that. There are different kinds of annuities. I've been writing yes. about these things for so long. Yes. In fact, I used to be I used to be the annuity coordinator for um, EF Hutton, which is a company that literally went out of business in 1988. <laughs> so I've been writing about these things for a very long time. Here's the thing. Annuities. Always, always an insurance company contract, like Miranda said. Mm -hmm. Three right. different basic types. You've got a fixed annuity, which is basically like a CD. You give the insurance company your money, they pay you interest on it. You've got a variable annuity, which is basically like a mutual fund. You, you put your money with the insurance company, and then you pick funds. A stock fund, a bond fund, a balance fund, like that. Mm -hmm. And then you get whatever you get, whatever results you get. Then you also have, and this is what most people think of when they hear the word annuity. They think of an immediate annuity. Mm -hmm. I give the insurance company hundred grand. They agree to pay me $1,000 a month for the rest of my life. Uh, so now, f when you have a fixed or a variable annuity, you can convert those to an immediate annuity. So, you might, so let's say that you're 55 years old and you put money into an annuity and, and it's either fixed or variable. Uh, and, and then when, when it comes time for you to retire, you convert whatever that's grown into into an immediate annuity, and it gives you fixed and it gives you a fixed income, either for life for ten years, for for life with ten years certain. There's a whole bunch of different kind of ways you can get the money paid out. So that's basically what an annuity is. Now back to our question here, uh, an indexed annuity says we're going to let you participate in the stock market. So if the S and P 500 goes up, 
you're going to earn money. And, and, and if the S&P 500 doesn't go up, it goes down, you're not going to lose money. And, and that's what most of them say. You know, they, they literally are saying, we're going to give you some stock market return when the stock market's good, and we're not even going to make you take losses when the stock market isn't good. Now, that sounds like a pretty good deal, right? right. So what's the catch? Then here it comes. I was just going to say, so what? Uh, so yeah, what is the catch? How do we do this? And should we be including this in our asset mix as, you know, for retirement? Yeah. And, well, I mean, first of all, you're always going to do your um, 401ks, your IRAs, you know, wh whatever you can do to get a deduction or to put money aside for retirement. You're, you're going to do that first. Now, if you've got, if you're fully funded in all your retirement accounts and you want to have some money, because here's something else I didn't mention about annuities. No matter what kind of annuity it is, and the reason people have annuities in the first place, one reason is because they're tax deferred. As long as that money is inside that annuity contract, you're not paying taxes on any gains you have. When you pull it out, it becomes taxable. The, another, another advantage to annuities is that they also bypass probate. So like with an IRA. When you sign up for an IRA, I, I say, you know, Miranda's going to be my beneficiary. I die, the money goes directly to her. It doesn't have to go through court. Same thing with, you know, life insurance, same, same type of thing. So these are some of the benefits of annuities. Now, let's talk about, I just, I just said something that sounded irresistible. You can participate in a stock market gain, but you don't lose money if the stock market goes down. That sounds like only an idiot would not want to do that, right? But there's a problem. First of all, there, there are a couple of problems. First. The, uh, you're going you're to you're gonna be limited to how much you can make. The stock, if the S&P goes up 30% in a year, you're, you might go up three. Well, and that's an exaggeration. You probably got more than that. So you're giving up some upside in order to protect that downside. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what's another, I, I'm just throwing this out there to see if you can get this, Miranda. What is, what, what's another major con of all insurance company contracts? Right, well, anytime, kind of Aaron alluded it to, alluded to it a little bit before about like, can you get your money out? Yeah, you can probably get your money out. But if you try and get it out before time, or if you try and change things up, you might be subject to fees. And things can get very, very expensive, very fast. Um, and not all of these contracts do have those survivor benefits. Not all of them will pass easily onto your heirs. And so in some cases, uh, just passing it on can come with a lot of fees. And I don't know if that's the con you were looking for, but well, the fees of, are yeah, the con I mean, that I yeah, see Yes, yes, well. fees. Fees is exactly what I was looking fees, for. Because, fees are the because con. Because there, there are high fees in annuities, and they're not often mm. disclosed where you can see what they are. Uh, and so, you know, as, a, as an investment advisor, I used to sell annuities. I told you I was an co annuity coordinator for EF Hutton. And the, the money they paid me was big. I mean, I got 4% commission on this. So a lot of, a lot of the, there's a lot of fees in these contracts of any kind of life insurance contract, which is one reason why life insurance contracts, despite the pros, also have cons. So there are fees in these contracts. If you're going to buy any kind of an annuity, you really want to shop it hard because there are, di there are differences. I don't we, know. We, we, we do have go a ahead. good episode. I'm sorry to, to cut you off, but we do have an episode That's, on this where we go through all the pros oh, and cons of annuities, and it's episode 95. If people want to really dig in deeper to this, because uh, we get into the weeds of it there. <clears throat> yeah. So, so be aware of the fees. Uh, know that your gains could be capped. But, but let's say, for example, let, let's have a, an example of someone who might be able to use one of these. Uh, we, we've already fully funded our retirement accounts. 50 years old. Um, don't, don't want to lose money, might want to get a little extra, you know, a little extra kicker from a good stock market. Maybe, th maybe that's, we might put some money into a, a fixed index annuity like this. But generally speaking, I'm not a huge um, proponent of annuities, simply because of the fee structure. And also, oh, and by the way, I want to revisit what you said at the beginning, Aaron. When you have an immediate annuity, in other words, I give my insurance company $100,000, they pay me $1,000 you know, a month, right. whatever, for life. Right. Okay, that's done. There's nothing I can do to get that money back. And that's, right, a, so that's, that's a disadvantage. Yes, an immediate annuity is locked in. You're toast. If I need $50,000 for, for a surgery, too bad. Can't get the money back. Now, right. the other ones, um, a variable annuity or this index annuity like we were just talking about, or uh, a fixed annuity that just pays an interest rate like a CD, you can get your money out of those contracts, but they're usually huge surrender fees, and, and they yeah. can go on for 10 years. So in other words, if you take it all out the first year, you pay 10%, second year, 9%, like that. Uh, they, and they differ, you know, so, but, so they're giant fees that take money out of annuities generally. And if it's an immediate annuity, you ain't taking it out. Right. Okay, so, so there, yeah. there's a little food for thought. <laughs> 
Yeah. And if you want to go deeper, like Aaron said, we do have uh, another episode about that and that will be linked in the show notes. So if you are looking for more information and going deeper, we do have a podcast episode about that. Yeah. Now, we do ne- discuss the whys and yeah. whens you, you should, mm-hmm. you know, get one or not get one and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I've thought about getting one, you know, because I'm getting older and I, and I wonder, and when I'm retired, when I finally retire, which will probably be never, but when I do, I, I, I need, I want to have a fixed income every month. So I don't have to worry about it. You know, because I could take money out of my my four hundred one k or my IRAs, but but I, maybe I want to get you know two thousand dollars a month by putting in a lump sum. I might do something like that. But generally speaking, this is the first time in my life I'm sixty seven. The first time I've even considered an annuity. But they're yeah. they're not that appealing to me. So yeah, so so check that out for more info. But let's our next two questions are actually related. So I'm going to kind of mush them together, and they shouldn't take very cool. long to answer. So, so our first, our next two questions are about I bonds. Uh, the first one is from Margaret. She wants to know where does one purchase I bonds, and then Jerry wants to know can you purchase two I bonds, one for the husband and one for the wife? This is referring to the limits that you have when you're purchasing I bonds. Uh, so let's do that. <laughs> let's yeah, let's you go. You can go to treasurydirect.gov to purchase your I bonds. Yep, and that's the only place you can get the them. One, right? It is the only place you can get them. Because um, yeah. you can buy T bills and things like that through a, a, an investment account, like you know Charles Schwab or Vanguard or something like that. But you can't buy I bonds there. You have to buy them directly from the treasury. Yeah. And now, you can what, also, the right? And no, then also uh, for Jerry, yes. So you can get, you know, you can do the max. So you can buy the max amount for you and the max amount for your wife, and that works out. And Aaron actually, uh, he and his wife went through this process not too long ago of uh, yeah. maxing out what they could get with their I bonds. I did. And I we, remember and, that. And we bought one. You can buy one for your company as well. Yes. We did that as yeah. well. Yeah. Essentially, you can buy I bonds. You get $10,000 as a limit, right? Mm-hmm. You can get an extra yeah. 5000 if you use a tax refund to get it. Yeah. Um, right. But, it, but basically, you're not buying an I bond. Your social security number is. So if you've exactly. got one. Your wife's got one. Exactly. Your business may have your LLC. You know, your business right. may have its own tax ID number. So as long right. as you've got different tax ID numbers, you can buy right. ten thousand. And with you each can one. purchase I bonds for relatives through TreasuryDirect.gov. Yes. So if you have you know a niece or something that you you know she's young, you want to buy an I bond for. You can if you know her social security number, you can buy for her. But it's you got to be very careful. And we talk about this. I forget which yes. episode we talk about it in, but the site is not great. Uh, you got to be very careful when you're inputting the data about your your banking information and stuff like that. If you do not get that information correct, it's going to be a nightmare to get it corrected. I heard they revamped it. But Did they? Yeah, th- they, I heard yeah, that. I haven't looked at it. They, they've updated it. They've updated it. It's a little bit easier to navigate. It is a little bit le- easier to use. They have updated it. And it is much, it looks better too. It looks so much nicer. Uh, and it is easier to navigate. <laughs> oh, but good. you still want to make sure you have all of your information correct and down pat. And before you complete your purchase, you want to make sure it's all correct. Because if you make a mistake in your bank's routing number or something like that, then it's going to kick back to you and it will take days or even weeks to fix it. So, right. so make sure you know your info before you move forward cool what's next so jeff jeff has a question he says i appreciate the info you provide daily thank you jeff um any idea when the best time to buy a tv is i've heard before the super bowl is a good time for sales thoughts what what do you think about this (laughs) i'm I'm kind of thinking i'm kind of thinking this is kind of a bs um, answer because I, I've been, again, this is something I've gotten a billion times over the years, and I've done TV news stories on it and said, Oh, here's the best time to buy TV. It's at the Super Bowl, it's at Black Friday, blah, blah, blah. Right. I'm wondering if they're, I mean, these are the traditional things Black Friday and just before the Super Bowl, or just after the, um, what's it called, the electronic show in Vegas? Yeah, yeah, the, the TV CES. release, sp- yeah, like it's CES spring when you're having that CES, yeah. when you're having that spring. Yeah thing because like the but that's and that's to buy like a prior that's for year's buying model this for buying last yes. year's models exactly yes. yeah. yeah because but I, and that's but actually a lot of yeah that's how i do my computers my laptops a lot is i go looking for last year's model or two years ago model <laughs> from someplace that still doesn't have yeah. them closed out and, and get a nice discount so when you're according, talking about electronics nerd wallet yeah it, yeah I, yeah exactly it's uh it's Dependent, especially now that we're in a in a at a time when there's no microchips or anything like that. I mean, all of these things cost through the roof. Uh, according to Nerd Wallet, the Super Bowl season, January and February, is the best time. The new TV release cycle, which is spring, Black Friday, 
are are the are the best times to to buy TVs and get the deals. But you know there are holidays. Um, I mean, ho- there are holiday sales all the time. That's that's what I'm thinking. You right. know, this it's right. kind of a it's kind of a BS thing because truth be told, it depends on where you live. Somebody's going out of business. Somebody's having a you know Fourth of July sale. I mean, you know, blah blah blah. There's there's a million right. different. Just keep you keeping your eye out, being patient. Right. Patience. Or, that's number one. Or you could thing. be Google searching for this one particular TV, and if you wait a few weeks, next thing you know, you're getting coupons <laughs> yeah. in your email for the same exact TV. Like, oh, great. Yeah, but but you know, tips to get the best deal on a TV in general: be patient. Also, uh, last year's technology is going to be cheaper, and uh, refurbished too. You, you guys ever buy yep. refurbished stuff? So I I actually sometimes well I used to buy my desktops refurbished, uh, and sometimes I and I and my laptops refurbished. The last one that I have now I actually bought new, but I don't mind buying refurbished. Uh, and I don't mind. And actually, my 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 current iPhone. I actually want to upgrade my iPhone. Um, this is an iPhone XR that I bought. You know, when the newer model had already come out, so it costs less. Um, and when I upgrade, I'm not going to upgrade to an iPhone 14. I'm going to see who's got an iPhone 12 or an iPhone 13 uh, kicking around their store that they can sell me for less. So I don't do. Oh, geez, baby, spend a little as money. I, I mean, come on. To. Yeah. Step up, step up to a 14, Miranda. <laughs> but I mean, but I, I don't do the refurbished as much as I used to. I used to do it much more um, when I was I younger and that. had less money. Uh, but now, yeah, but now I like, I like just buying, you know, a model that's one or two behind that's still kicking around the store that somebody wants I, to And I think what of. you're saying is exactly right. You want to buy a TV, know exactly the kind of TV you want. Do you mm-hmm. want it to be 65 inches, 85 inches, 42 inches? And then just hone in on all of the little things that you want out of that TV. Do you want it mm-hmm. to be, have, you know, HDR and anything like that? So as, the more you know about what you want, then you just hone in on those specific models and then just keep price comparing until you find the deal you want. You, yeah. you know what I do, guys? I tell Aaron I need something. And then Aaron does all this research, <laughs> looks at YouTube videos. Well, Aaron's, a, I mean, he's, he's been buying right, cameras yeah. and lenses, all kinds he's of crap for, for decades. So, and, and he likes doing it, I'm hoping anyway, because I make him do it anytime I want to buy anything. In fact, I, in fact, I was buying a new camera that we're using. I'm not using it right now. Because remember last, last time we had a podcast, my camera didn't work. So I went out and bought a new webcam. And Aaron, you know, to his credit, he, he sent me all kinds of information. Here's the best one, you know, blah, blah, blah. You should do it. So, folks, here's my advice. Tell Aaron you need something. He'll find it for you. <laughs> oh, we got one. We got time for one more before we go to break. Not really. Yeah, let's let's do one more real yeah, quick. So you want to do a real uh, quick one? Okay. Yeah. So this one is from Elizabeth, and Elizabeth says, "What are some tax efficient ways to spend your IRA accounts once retired? Should you put it in real estate, especially in highly inflated areas like California? Is it worth taking out IRA funds to buy a house in a higher cost area at this time?" So I thought that was interesting. Um, you know, I think. You know they're trying to spend down their their IRA, <laughs> so um, yeah. and and want to take advantage of that tax efficiency. Of course, if you um, don't have a Roth, then you are going to have to pay taxes on the money when you bring it out. So, if you're putting it into real estate, that's a big chunk of money you're going to have to spend taxes on if you're going to make a big down yeah. payment. So, that I don't know. What do you think, right. Stacy? I, I probably I, here's what I think. I think Elizabeth wants to buy a house and wants our blessing to do it by taking money out of her IRA. <laughs> right, right. But, that's what I was thinking. Uh, but I, I, I agree with you, Miranda. I, I think if you're going to take a giant chunk out of your IRA like that, um, you're going to pay a lot of income taxes, unless it's Roth. If it's Roth, go for it. Uh, right. If it's regular, uh, I'd be careful about you know the, looking at the tax bill. I, and of course, it depends on what your income is and whether you're going to go into a higher bracket and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I, I, and frankly, by the way, let me throw this in here too. I don't think it's a good time to buy a house. <laughs> I mean, I think, house, <laughs> I think house prices are going to come down some. So right. I wouldn't be taking money in my IRA right now to buy a house. Especially in a high cost area. Yeah. And, Cal- and prices in, Cal- in California are coming down more than they are in other parts of the country, obviously, depending right. on where in California you're talking about. Yeah, so I think I think that's a really, you know, <laughs> that's that's going to that's going to cause issues. If you're looking for a way to kind of spend down, you know, take a look at some of the stuff we've written. I think we've done some stuff on like sequence of returns and things like that that can help you kind of figure out a tax strategy to say, okay, do I want to do I spend down my traditional IRA uh, in a way to reduce my RMDs later and how do I do that? How do I make sure that I can balance my and spread my tax my tax efficiency out over time? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, okay, now we're going to take a really quick break. When we come back, we got a question about sex. Okay, but first, 
We're going to take we're going to take a quick break. It's time to pay the bills. Uh, we're going to answer more of your questions, including the sex question, when we get back right after this quick break. Okay, we are back. I lied about the sex question. There is no sex question. I mean, there's um, <laughs> one that's sort of related. Somebody's frustrated. Is there? <laughs> yes, I, at I the may end. Not have seen, Somebody's I may frustrated, not have seen but we'll get there. Questions. Stick around to find out about this frustration. <laughs> 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 so we're going to keep them on the chain? Okay. Um, All right, yeah, no, let's keep oh, them on the chain. But by let's the way, start before, with, before, we get, yeah. before we get back to questions, real quick thing. Uh, I forgot. Aaron wants me to do this every time we take a break. Um, be sure and share the show with your friends, guys, if you like it. Uh, it really helps us if you sign up for, our, if, you re- if you subscribe to our podcast. It takes you two seconds. really helps us out, though. So si- uh, be sure and subscribe. And be sure to tell your friends, too. We really appreciate it. Okay, back, back to questions. What do we got? Yeah, so first of all, um, this one is kind of related to our last retirement question. It's about required minimum distributions, or RMD, RMDs. And Joseph says, my question is about RMDs. Is the required distribution age 72 or is it now 73? I turned sub- I turned 72 in September 2022, but I keep reading the new age is, 20, is 73. Can you confirm this? Oh, dear Lord. Uh, <laughs> no, I see what's going on because I, yes. I, I, yes. I did this little quick search and I found out there is a bunch of articles out there for some some reason saying 73 well it is that's fake and and that's kind of it's sort of fake news it depends on how you search right you know what terms you use to search and if you search certain terms you will get these articles that say 73 yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Here's, you know, why and that's fake Go news. Ahead, Miranda, so let's, you let's know why. Put the record straight. Yeah. So part of the reason is, so it used to be what, how they figure out when you start taking your RMDs is you take your first RMD by April of the year after you turn the thing. <laughs> so like, right. yeah, so it, so, so it gets kind of confusing. So if you, so if you turned 72 in September, 2022, you need to take your first RMD by April, 2023. So you will be 72 when you take your RMD. Um, well, no, he'll be 73. No, no, because he just turned no, seventy-two. Because he turned seventy-two oh, he, oh, in sorry, September. This specific yeah. person just turned seventy-two yeah, in September. Specific that's right. That's person. right. This yes. specific person just turned seventy-two in September. No, if he t- if he turned seventy-two in March of this year, then he would be seventy-three yes. on April first of next year. So you yes. could be seventy-three. This specific person, seventy-two, is what how old he's right. Be. And so that's where the confusion comes in: is that you take your first RMD starting in the year that you turn 72 and you take it the year after that. And so right. for for some people, sure, you might be 73 when that happens. Uh, but for the ma- vast majority of people, you'll probably be 72 when you take your first RMD. Well, by we that did April explain what date. RMD means, right? Before we yes, started the discussion. Okay. <laughs> well, yes, yes your required distribution. Di- minimum distribution, which you have to take from your traditional right. IRA or any 401k and a whole host of things. If you don't so, so you have to take this this amount of money, and it is used. They use a formula based on how big your balances are in your your. No, really, uh, it's just how old accounts. you're going to be. I mean, how old, how old so are you going to live? Well, basically, for Joseph, what it is is the threshold right. is that if you're if you're born if you're what is it? So if you're you reach the age of seventy two, but you're born after nineteen forty nine, so June thirtieth of nineteen forty nine, you're born after that, which he was. He was born September nineteen fifty. Right. Right, so he's after that threshold, right? And so he, uh, so now he's going to become. What do you just turned seventy two, right? And you have to take your your RMD your first the following one. following April by yeah by April one by April one. So okay. the bottom, so now, but the bottom line here is the Secure Act changed, increased the age. The threshold used to be seventy and a half. Now this threshold is seventy two. Pretty much, we are past the point of the situation where anybody who is going to start tar- taking RMDs at this point is going to be at that 72 threshold. We've passed that age limit. Right. Anybody who's going to be taking new RMDs will be doing it with the calculation from 72, the age of yeah. 72. And it's, it's simple. It's simple calendar math. And we'll put a link yes. in there. It's at the irs.gov has a, has a retirement topic, required minimum distribution page, and it lists all of the uh, requirements for this. Um and you can just backtrack right. your dates. And, and, really and by easy. the way, too, just but as for a you specifically, of, Joseph, you're going to be 72, and yeah, you're going to need to take your first RMD by April of 2023. G- generally exactly. speaking, too, just a quick tip: uh, if you what, what they really do in order to determine how much you're required to to take out, 
Um, they all they do is d- see how many years you have left to live. Well, so, yeah, they look at your balance. They look at your balances. Your and balance then they look doesn't at- matter. I don't think I could be wrong. I'm not an expert on this, but uh, they, basically, they just say, you know, I, I've got, I'm 67. My, I'm going to live 23 more years. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all it is is a what's it called an actuarial table, and so I've got to take out 1 23rd of my IRA if I'm 72. I'm not. Um, so, so that, but that, I don't think the amount matters. Am I wrong about that, Miranda? Yeah. So, so what you have to do is what they're going to do is they're going to take a look at your, you know, the, your distribution period, like, like you said, the actual, ta- the actual actuarial, actuarial table tables. And, and, and decide how long you're going to leave. But then you have to divide your balance by the distribution period. So oh, yeah, well, you're you, sure your yeah. amount matters in that respect. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm talking about. It's you're going to have to I'm divide sorry. that out. Yeah. Yes. And so if you have a combined $100,000 and you're a your eligible accounts and your period is 25.6 then you're going to be paying 3900 about a little more than yeah, 3900 dollars for yeah. that year right and so then yeah. you pay you know you'll pay your taxes um on that amount so a lot of people there are different ways to reduce that um and you know we have some articles about how to manage your rmd and we'll have those in the show notes where you can go on the website to learn more about managing your rmd cool. Now, before I have to take my RMD, let's move to the next question. Yes. <laughs> so, so Heather says, as inflation increases and our pay remains the same, how does one continue to eat well and manage a home with all the rising costs in grocery and retail stores? Any ideas for average folks to live well while our money is not going as far? And we do have we do have an episode about this. I'm going to plug that real quick. We do have an episode about beating inflation. So we'll have that linked up. But uh, Stacy, do you have any tips? Yeah. Go to moneytalksnews.com. I mean, we have 14,000 articles. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, and not all of not all of which are helping you stretch your money, but many of them are. I mean, there's a million different ways that you can make your money go farther, and you can still eat well. And and we talk about a lot of them every time we do a podcast, practically, because I mean, you know, uh, first of all, you know, another thing too, inflation may not be as bad for some people as it is for others. Everyone's got their own personal inflation rate. For example, yeah. I own a house. Okay, uh, so forty uh, percent b- between thirty and forty percent of what they call the inflation rate is housing. Well, if inflation's making my house go up in value, that's benefiting me. It ain't costing me anything. It's helping me. So, you know, depending on who you are, the inflation may, may not be as bad as the headline rate that you see. Uh, but when it comes to things like groceries, no question, groceries are going up. So how would, yeah. how would you eat well? Uh, well, you would probably find things, remember that the fresher the food, the less it costs and the better it is for you as, uh, as a matter of fact. So when you, if you can buy fresh food, if it's eating out, eating out's gotten more expensive. Eat, it, eat something at home, split an entree at the restaurant. Uh, you know, I mean, there, there's a million different ways you can stretch dollars. I don't care what it is you're spending money on. Uh, we're just talking about electronics before the break. Buy refurbished. Th- there's a lot of ways that you can save money and still have a high quality of life. Uh, what, what do you yeah. think, man? Anything to add there? Yeah, or, well, and I think too, looking, so we actually just had a grocery outlet store open up in our town. And so some of the food, if you're going to buy it fresh in a grocery outlet store, you do have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that some of these things are going to be close to their spoilage date. So you need to really plan that meal ahead of time. So, and make sure you know what you're going to buy at the grocery outlet and everything else. But they also have a lot of really great frozen things that you can get frozen foods that you can get for cheap, um, buy them, put them in the freezer, portion them out. Uh, so there, there are different things that you can do, but I really enjoyed the grocery outlet. Uh, and I just need to make sure that I grab the flyer, see what's going to be on sale and really plan my meals out if I'm going to use the grocery outlet. You know what because- my wife did just the other day? She went to a clothing swap party. They, oh, they, yeah. they, all, they all go to these, this one woman's house. Uh, and I, I think it was like 20 women. I don't know because men aren't allowed. But they all bring their clothes that they're not wearing, put them on tables, and then they drink, <laughs> and then they try on clothes, <laughs> and does. they bring them home. So you get, they all get new wardrobes. All they're doing, you know, they're yep. swapping wardrobes, essentially. Yep. Uh, and it yep. didn't cost a dime. So I mean, yeah. there's a million different ways that, that you can save money. Uh, it, you just have to use a little imagination. Put your money where your wallet is. I mean, put your, your mind where your wallet is. Uh, yeah. and, and you can figure and- it out. 
One more thing that I've done specifically for food and specifically for meat prices recently is that I had a friend who was going to buy. So this is something we can do out West here, people, but a, a friend who was going to buy a quarter of a beef, right? So the the person raising the beef uh, will sell out parts of it and, and different things like you can get a certain amount of steaks or ground beef or whatever. And so this friend of mine, uh, he's also single. And so he rounded up four or five of us single people and was just like, hey, do you want to go in on a quarter of a beef with me? And then we'll split up the results. And so it actually cost quite a lot less because the four of us split the cost of going directly going directly to the person who raises the cow and uh, getting a quarter of the beef. And so, uh, and I've done this too with... Um, with pigs. So we've done, you know, to get sausage and bacon and whatnot, I actually just split that with two other people. And so this is another way that you can save money on costs uh, by looking for these kinds of arrangements. And this works especially well if you are like me, single, and you can find some single friends to sp split some costs with. Yeah, you could do the same thing, but going to well, warehouse stores, right? If you're single. Oh, yeah, yeah. Buying Buy bulk. Yeah. And then everybody shares the cost and then divide it up and freeze it. But speaking of cows, if you go to moneytalksnews.com and, and do a search for saving money, you'll be reading until the cows come home. That is true. So here <laughs> is a, a, a question. My mortgage from Charlie. My mortgage company has bun, been bought out by a bigger company. I'm a 78-year-old widow and concerned they will charge me more. Can the company make changes to my original mortgage and force me to pay more each month? I'm already squeezed to the max and will not be and, and, and I want to be able to keep my home. So what do you think? What do you think, Stacey? You've done all these consumer these consumer investigations. Yeah, well, well, you know about scams, yeah. but it, uh, no, yeah. the thing is, one thing you got to realize is that it's, it's very common for your servicer, your mortgage servicer to mm -hmm. change. It happens all the time. Um, now, can they change the terms of your mortgage? Hell no. You can't do that. I mean, you, no, the you, contract's locked yeah, in. You signed a contract mm -hmm. with them, but you're paying a certain interest rate. Now, all your I, terms follow mortgage. Yeah. You know, actually, Aaron, I, I did look up, though. I mean, I knew the answer to this question off the top of my head, but I, I did look up, can the mortgage servicer change their fee? I couldn't find anything online suggesting that they could. Uh, but I, I think that, I, I don't think they do at all. I think, I think that's one of the terms that comes with your mortgage. And I, I don't think anybody can raise yeah. any kind of fee at all. But, no, right. I think your, your contract has to follow you. I mean, it'd be, mm -hmm. the only way that term would be changed is if you refinance, I think, or if you- yeah. Well, sure, and then you've got a new contract. Yeah. Right. And then the other thing you have to watch out for is if you're on a variable rate mortgage, right? So if your mortgage well, rate true. is a variable rate, yeah. uh, that's going to change. But that's going to change with market rates. And as market rates are rising right, right now, uh, you're likely to see that. But as long as you have a fixed rate mortgage and you're locked into your current mortgage, uh, the, the, it shouldn't change. You shouldn't have to pay more and you should yes. be able to keep your home. So good you, news, You Charlie. said, can the company make changes to my original mortgage? Isn't that what you said that she asked? Right. Yeah. Well, then, right. No, the answer to yes. that's no. No, no, no. Yep. Yep. Hell to the no. So, they cannot do so that. So that's a, that's a nice, fast question. That was nice and easy. So here we have another good one. We're going to do this one, and then we're going to get to our frustrated person. So <laughs> <laughs> This is going to be boring when we actually get there. <laughs> right. You know, I'm it's seeing not going to be as I'm fun as you I'm seeing this name, L4. And <laughs> yeah. your next question, I'm seeing this name, L4, and I... I'm pretty sure he's he's asked questions before. I've oh, seen really? his name before. You recognize yeah. his name? So it says, I recognize his yes. name, yeah. So it says, I often hear Stacy say to keep money in cash. I don't know what that means. I know you don't mean to sock it away in a sock drawer, but do you mean it should be in sub, some type of precious metals? No, ETF, that is not cash. Uh, a low interest money market account or what? I have money in a brokerage settlement account that I guess earns more than my bank, 0.06%, but is that the best place to put cash right now? Thanks. So first of all, yes, your brokerage settlement account, they're going to pay you a very small amount of interest on that. But there are places like right now, Ally, the online bank Ally has uh, is offering over three percent for their high yield savings account right now, and that's going to change, you know, when rates start dropping. But right now, if you shop around at an online savings account uh, or or something like that, you are likely to find much better rates. Uh, Stacy, yeah, or T bills. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, T bills are the best deal going right now. I mean, right. as we yeah. speak, interest rates are a little down today, but generally speaking, you you get four and a half percent. On a third, on a three month T bill, I mean, and that's pretty, I mean, and that's guaranteed. But anyway, let right. me let me say something too, though, to L four. I want to apologize because people like me always use the word cash. What we mean mm -hmm. is, 
It's money that we can get our hands on right away that's totally safe. It does not mean that it's literally dollar bills, okay? Right. So uh, putting it in a money market fund, putting it in a savings account, putting it somewhere, it's the same thing. When I say cash, that's what I mean. And what right. Miranda said, obviously, is also true. You want to get the highest interest rate you can while maintaining liquidity, meaning the ability to turn it into dollar bills, and uh, also uh, safety. So, right. So when you're looking go, at go these ahead. kinds of things, yes, yeah, so when you're looking at these things, the precious metals ETF is not your cash equivalent. Uh, definitely want to make sure oh, that no. we make that clear. A precious metals ETF is not a cash equivalent. Uh, like like Stacy said, the goal is liquidity and safety. And a precious metal ETF is neither of those things. So we want to make sure that we're looking at like a high yield savings account, a money market account that pays well. Uh, CDs are generally a poor choice unless you've built a CD ladder because you can't get immediate access without paying a paying a penalty. So it's really important to think about, okay, what am I going to use the money for? When do I want access to it? And how do I get the best yield for what I'm looking for? Yes. And, and you know, right. right now, as we speak, bank stocks are great to own right now. You know why? Because they're borrowing money from, uh, they're, they're borrowing money from you when you deposit your money in a savings account and they're paying you 0.1%. They're earning right. 6% risk free. Uh -huh. At the Federal I, Reserve. I think also what you mean by having a little liquid sometimes, though, is like, let's say, like, for example, I have a, a Fidelity account. I don't want it in my savings account. When, the, when a stock drops, you can't buy it because it's sitting in your savings account. So by liquid, you mean it's just sitting in a, in a, in a fund. It's, it's sitting in a in money Fidelity market account as, with Fidelity. As liquid, in a money market account, just sitting there waiting for you to be able to buy the stock when it does drop. Yes. So I guess that's really what you mean by having a little bit of liquid. Yeah, well, I mean, right. yeah, I mean, I have a lot of liquid. Cash. I, I have a lot of money right. in money market accounts, and I have some money in right. treasuries too. Uh, so you know, now treasury technically having a th having even a three month T bill is not liquid because I can't turn right. any cash instantly. Um, right. But but I keep a lot of money in money market accounts, and, and in fact, I just checked yesterday. My my money market account at um, Schwab is paying three point seven percent, and the one I have at uh, Vanguard was similar. So right. the, the key is don't right, be a schmuck it would take, and leave your money in a bank it. earning 0 0.01 when they're earning five on it. That's insane. Right. So you, right. you take your money out of that bank and you put it in a money market fund. Obviously, if you've got $200, it doesn't matter much because you're not going to make much interest either way. But if right. you've got $100,000, do not let the bank take advantage of you by paying you 0.01% or 0.5% when you could be earning 5%. So shop around for those things. You go to moneytalksnews.com. Go to, go to our, um, our, our uh, solution center, and we'll show you where the highest uh, bank rates are or uh, savings account rates are around the country. Or, or open a brokerage account and use their money market fund. Yeah, because it could take, like, if you wanted to buy a stock and it drops, it, it might, and it's sitting in your savings account, it's going to take three days to transfer oh, that I money Oh, I see what you were saying it, now. If, if you I'm have it in the that, bank. Then, Yes, if you have in the true. bank and you want to use it for stocks when it drops, you want to put that, Absolutely. as you call it, liquid into your money mutual fund yeah, because all of my it'll take you three days to transfer funds. that money over there, and a lot can change in those three days. Yeah, and I think that's and I think that's where we go back to okay, what is the purpose of this money? What are we doing? So really, what we're talking about once again goes back to what is the purpose of the money? What you're going to do with it? When Stacy says keep some money in cash and you're doing it for liquidity purposes so you can take advantages of a, of a stock market that drop, then yes, leaving it in your brokerage settlement account, even though you're not getting very much interest, makes sense. Because as Aaron said, you want to deploy that money quickly. And so even though you're not earning a high yield on it, the purpose of the money isn't to earn a high yield. The purpose of the money is to be ready to take advantage of a stock market crash or an economic downturn. And so the yield isn't as important. Now, if you are wanting money to be liquid and accessible for like an emergency, then you say, right. okay, yeah, I want it in a bank. I want it in, in a form or a market, money market account or some sort of form that's going to pay me somewhere between 3% and 5% APY so that I can get those returns as, as high as possible, but also have access to the money for an emergency. So really your first step is to say, what is the money for? When do I need it, and how quickly am I going to need to deploy it for whatever its purpose is? Well said. Well Perfect. said, Miranda. So, Perfect. Okay. All right. Let, here we go to our last question, Whew, the frustration question. question. <laughs> oh, let's get to the sex. Oh, wait. So, I feel like we're going to make something up now. <laughs> so this comes from frustrated wife. 
That's that's the name she gave us. Frustrated wife says, so my husband refuses to save any of his money. He is 71 years old, is retired and has high blood pressure, diabetes and fibromyalgia. He is currently living. I, we're having fun now. I'm sorry. That's, I'm sorry. That, that wasn't funny. <laughs> is that funny? It it's not funny. It sucks. Funny. But he is currently living off of his social security with no other savings and believes that his money is to be spent to enjoy life and not have to save it. I am 71 years old as well, and I work full time. I've run out of reasons to give him as to why he should be saving his money as he grows older. Are there any suggestions you can give me to help him understand the importance of saving money? Well, obviously, he's going to live to 150. So. <laughs> well, wait a minute, guys. This, this, take the 71 years old and, and the fibromyalgia out of it. Well, this, is the, this is an age-old question. You got, you got mm -hmm. a spender married to a saver. Doesn't matter how old they yeah. are. It's the same thing. Yeah, true. I mean, everybody's got this. Even, even I'm, I'm more of a saver. My wife's more of a spender. I mean, everybody's got this uh, dynamic. Not everybody, but a great many people have this dynamic in their married life. So yes. what, what, what was your immediate response to this, Miranda? Well, so, so my immediate response to this is uh, he's retired and I think it's super great that she's the same age and working to support him because apparently that's what she's doing. And I hope that she has her own money socked away somewhere that's not in a joint account with him. And um, so that if things become intolerable, she can peace out. But uh, which is <laughs> which I know like is, a bitter divorcee. Yeah, I'm not bitter though. That's say. the funny thing. Uh, but but the the bottom line is right is that he is seeing his money as a way to spend and enjoy life, and he is having an, a fun life. And I think that she does feel a little bit of resentment for the fact that she is working. She is trying to make sure the finances are shored up for the future, and he's he's spending and enjoying life. And I don't disagree with the idea of spending to enjoy life. I have designed my life in a way that allows me to spend money on things like, you know, uh, getting my nails done twice a month and having extensions in my hair. So I, I am not going to quarrel with the idea that, yes, you want to have that balance between spending money to enjoy your life, but you also need to be preparing for the future. And this is a very philosophical question. They're both right. Well, right, they, exactly. I mean, there's exactly. no wrong here. Yeah, they are. But I that, think, that's why it's interesting. Yeah, but the frustration comes in to where they're not sharing the same values in terms of how do we strike that balance. And there's not a balance in terms of, and this is obviously, I don't know them. We need more details. I'm projecting. I'm definitely projecting here. Uh, but the reality of the situation is, is she is the same age he is. She is working and saving, and she is probably providing them the basis of their lifestyle. You don't know and that. So, you didn't say that. I don't. That's why I said I'm projecting. <laughs> yeah. I said I'm projecting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I qualified here. that. But she's still working, and she wants to save for the future and make sure there's some savings for the future. And he wants to enjoy life. And so and he's as, been working his ass off all his life and he wants he's to take it easy. seen right. the end, end of the road. And he's like, yeah. man, I'm going to go have some what? fun. Let me give you Which guys I don't a... blame him for. I 100% do not blame him for. Yeah. But what they need to do is sit down as a couple and get on the same page Thank and that... figure, out, figure out, okay, uh, where are we at? How do we both be able to enjoy our lives the way we want? One of the things I did like about my ex-husband is that you know one of the things we did was we took a look at like okay I like to travel he likes he likes things he likes the comforts of home he likes to entertain and how do we balance these different priorities in a way that allows us both to have access to some of the things that we want and yeah. how do we make this happen and I think that's you know you're, you're never going to be able to force him to save you can't make people do things you know, you're never going to be able to force him to say, but you can sit down and say, hey, how do we both arrange things? How do we work on our shared goals? And how do we work on our shared values? You're absolutely right. You know, Miranda, he just, it just, just occurred to me I, when you said that, I'm going to do the same thing with my wife. I, I like entertaining at home and she likes, we, we both like traveling, but she's more likely to want to go out to a bar or mm -hmm. something than I am. Uh, and, and, you know, let me, let, me, let me just summarize everything though, if I, if I can for a minute. <laughs> Here's the thing. If you want to get sideways with your spouse, if you want to have fights, forget money, just in general. If you want to have <laughs> fights with your spouse, be right all the time. Okay? <laughs> be sure that be sure that you're correct. And then you will be guaranteed to have fights. Because you know the truth is, as you guys have both pointed out, the truth is 
There ain't no point in having money and taking it to the grave. And right. it's stupid not to save for a rainy day. Both these right. things are true. But if you're yeah. convinced that your way is right, and like I said, I don't care if it's about money or anything else, you're going to be sideways. I will guarantee you, because you're not always right, and probably both of you are right. So the way I would approach this is I would say, and in fact, this is the way I approach this with my wife. I, I understand that you like to go out, and I understand that I like to go home, or I like to stay home sometimes and entertain here. But we're both right, you know, and, and then, and, and, you know, I'm sorry if I don't like to go out all the time and she's, and then she'll be, next thing you know, your spouse is going, well, I'm sorry too. And now you found some common ground. And, and the same thing could, could happen here with these folks. You know, he, you're, you're both right, but don't go in burying your teeth, you know, right. go in, go in and say like, you know, I can certainly understand why you want to spend that money mm -hmm. because right. you've got high blood pressure, diabetes, and fibromyalgia. <laughs> So, I mean, we're and everything not you just said and then, leads to more sex. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot there was supposed to be some sex in this. <laughs> so we brought it back around, full circle. <laughs> yeah, that's what, he, that's what she could do. She could say, well, if you like sex, you might want to take a look at my point of view. <laughs> anyway, wait, we're getting sidetracked. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for putting on the music before we got it, before I dug myself a deep, a deep hole there. I'm afraid we're out of time, folks. We are never out of topic. Dig a little deeper. You're going to find links to lots more info in our show notes. And remember, if your goal is to make more, to spend less, to retire rich, your online home is moneytalksnews.com. And don't forget to check out Miranda's online home as well. That is Miranda Marquit, M-A-R-Q-U-I-T.com. If you got a question, comment you'd like to suggest, well, you know what to do. you got to email us, hello at moneytalksnews.com. Maybe we'll read your question on the air one day. That is hello at moneytalksnews.com. One final thing, if you like what we do, do something for us. Subscribe to our podcast. Takes you two seconds, helps us. So if you like us, show us and tell your friends too. I'm Stacy Johnson. I'm Miranda Marquet. I'm Aaron Freeman. Thanks for hanging out with us, guys. We're going to see you right here next time.